invite you to take your scriptures this morning and join me once again in John's Gospel, chapter 8, John chapter 8. As we look together at John chapter 8, I remind you the challenge that I face looking at a passage like this is John records for us one ongoing interaction between, between Jesus and his hearers, in particular those who are... Um, detractors of his, the religious leadership there in Jerusalem, and there's so much here. In order for us to try to look at it together, we need to break it up a little bit, but it's been one long interaction as Jesus has taken the occasion of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, when the nation of Israel is looking back and remembering God's provision for them coming out of Egypt in the wilderness and is thanking him for his provision even in the past year of bringing them the waters that they need to sustain them and sustain life and looking ahead to the day when he will fulfill his promises to glorify himself in the nation. Jesus has taken opportunity here to say you're looking at this water ceremony where you're thanking God for the water and I want to say to you if anyone is thirsty let him come to me because if you'll come to me you will have within you springing up a well of water springing up to eternal life I'm the source of that living water and as you rejoice in the glory of the lights of the temple grounds over the course of these nights of the feast I want to tell you that I am the light of the world. If you want to see, I'm the light of the world. And as Jesus spoke, we're told by John in chapter 8 that some, verse 30, many believed on him as he spoke these words. And again, the response from our heart initially is, well, that sounds great, except we remember the pattern that John has shown us. In John chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, many saw the miracles that Jesus did in Jerusalem and said that they believed, but John says Jesus knew the reality of their hearts, and their belief was superficial. It was external, intellectual at best. But he didn't entrust himself to them. In John chapter 6, after feeding the multitudes with the bread and the fish, they clamored after him and Jesus said to them directly, the reason you're following me is because you saw the food. But even there, he did not give himself over to them. He knew the reality of their hearts. And here, after he's speaking, there are some present. We see many say that, that they believe. There is a certain level of belief here, but what does Jesus think about that? Well, we've seen already as Jesus speaks to those who say they believe, we've seen beginning with verse 30 or so that Jesus is light for the world. That's what he's told them. We've seen that Jesus is the light of the world and that walking in his light, we're able to see some truth that we focused on last week. Walking in his light, if we listen to him and believe him and take him for what he says, we will see, as we saw last week, we'll see our true condition. Remember, he's speaking to these people. Let me just pick up the reading in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those to those Jews which believed on him. And let, let me stress that again. In our day today, Ask most people in this country, do you believe in Jesus? Depending on what part of the country you're in. But especially where I grew up, down in the, in the Midwest and in the South, everybody believes in Jesus. Everybody does. At least that's what they'll tell you. But when we use the word believe today, it's an intellectual type of agreement. It's acknowledging certain facts to be true or accepting certain things as true. So, do you believe in Jesus? Well, I believe there was a historical person named Jesus. Yes, I I believe that this Jesus was a historical figure. Yes, I believe that this Jesus was well known and maybe even I believe he did miraculous things. Maybe I believe that he was hanged on a cross and put to death and maybe you'd even say I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that. I 
up here. I, I acknowledge that. And if you want to say that's true, I, I will agree with you that, yeah, those things are true. But when we talk about belief from a scriptural standpoint, when God talks about the kind of belief that he's after, it's more than that. And so as you read the words of Jesus, as you hear Jesus' words to these people, keep in mind that John heads this for us by saying that Jesus is speaking to the Jews who believed in him. Or at least said they did. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, that is amen, amen. I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, that is physically, I know that. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Remember, if you abide in my word, then you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. My word has no place in you, verse 37. I speak that which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth which I have heard from God. That's not what Abraham did. Verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. So now they start to see he's not talking about just physical parentage here. He's talking about a religious and ethical descent. And they said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father. Even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father. Again, he's speaking to those that said they believed him. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? He answers his own question, even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. We'll pause there for a moment. As we saw last week, Jesus is the light of the world. He is light for those who follow him. His life is for those who believe him and walking in his light, we are able to see. We see the truth of our condition. We are slaves to sin. I think about an opportunity I had. You, you all know I've, I've done a lot of funerals in my time here and I've had many opportunities to do funerals for families that are not part of our church. And I was thinking of one in particular where there was a family member for someone who was in our church and I spoke with, with them afterwards and they, they said that, uh, they said, you know, Pastor, today a friend of mine came to the viewing and came up to, to talk to me and said, I just want to pay my respects and let you know I love you and I'm you know, sorry for your loss. 
um, but I'm not going to stay for the funeral. I don't like your pastor because he's going to tell me I'm a sinner and I'm not. And I thought, but that's, that's pretty impressive. You and Jesus, that's, you know, not a sinner. That would be you and Jesus. That would be, you know, that's pretty impressive. Now, I'm disappointed at that response, certainly. But one thought that I had when I heard that was, hey, somebody actually heard something that I said. He's going to tell me I'm a sinner and I'm not. Jesus says to these people, listen, if the Son sets you free, you will be free. Well, we're free. No, you're in bondage because you're still in sin. You're sinners. I'm a sinner. Thankfully, Jesus said he came to save sinners. So if you're not a sinner, I guess he can't help you too much. Because that's who he came to save. But we see in him our true condition. We are still slaves to sin. We see our true nature set against Christ. Sons of the evil one. Again, not as direct physical descendants, but those characterized by that which motivates him. We read through Scripture the contrast. There's not a lot of middle ground in Scripture. You're a children of light or or a Child of darkness, you're, you're children of his kingdom or children of the kingdom of this world. You're, you're under Christ or you're under the evil one. It's, it's in or out. It's, it's him or not him. And as we listen to what Jesus tells these people, I'll remind you again, if we're talking religion, these people were more religious than any of us have ever thought about being. These people had been living, some of them had been meticulously living their application of the laws of Moses. Much more religious than us. And Jesus said, you're still in your sins. You're separated and against the one that God has sent. And you're still under the influence of the evil one. He showed us our true condition and our true nature. He also showed us what it means to really believe. If you abide in my word, if you believe what I'm telling you, it's going to change the way that you are living. And that's, that's the concept. Throughout Scripture, to believe the way God tells us to believe always involves what we do. That's James' whole issue in his entire book. How can you tell me that you have faith, but you don't do anything? Go ahead, tell me. Show, show me your faith without doing something. How, did, how does that work? You say you have faith without any works. I will show you my faith by my works. His his word is not to say it's by doing good works that I earn good favor with God. He's saying the reality of my relationship with God, the reality of my faith, because I believe, it motivates me to live out obedience to God. True belief continues in the word. We talked about that last week as well. Jesus said to them, if you will abide in my word, if you'll stay there. That's why I appreciated what the man said you know, years ago. Is a Christian is one who has repented unto salvation and continues repenting unto salvation. I have to repent multiple times a day. Because the natural bent of my flesh is not in line with the God who created me. So as we listen to what Jesus said, he is the light for the world. And as we mentioned, light exposes things. If you turn on the light, you see things better. And some things we don't want to see. But we see the reality of our condition. We see the reality of our nature. We see the reality of what it means to truly believe. And as we move forward into this last little segment here, it's still connected. It's all together. But could we see at least or consider today that Jesus, the light, is our one true hope. He said again in verse 12, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He said to them in verse 28, 
that you'll know me when you've lifted me up because he's come to do what God sent him to do. He tells them in verse 31, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. He is our one true hope. One of the things I'm thankful for about God's word is he tells us the truth. And that means he tells us the truth about our condition. He tells us the truth about our sinfulness. He tells us the truth that we are separated from him by our sin. But he never tells us the truth just to make us feel bad. He tells us the truth so we will repent and come to him because he has hope for us. Jesus is light for the world. When we see his light, we're able to see the reality of our condition. Yes, we're able to see what the problem is. We're also able to see that God himself has provided the solution. Jesus, the light, is our true hope. Consider with me today, as we've already looked in these, some of these verses here in verse 31, we see that Jesus speaks the word of God. He speaks the word of God. Let me just toss these up here because we've, we've hit some of this truth, but I just want to put this in front of you again. He speaks the word of God, and it is his word that sets us free from sin. Again, that's different from the direction of our world. The, the response of our world is to say, okay, if this is your desire, if this is what you truly desire, then... If God says, if God in his word or people who say they're speaking for God in his word say you shouldn't be doing these things, then what you need to do is ignore that word and pursue your desires because that's the only way you'll be truly happy and fulfilled. Just double down on it. But Jesus says, no, if you will hear my word, if you'll abide in my word, then you will know what's true and that truth will set you free. The word sets us free from sin. Not by telling us just, hey, just just keep indulging in it, but by telling us this is something that Christ came to remedy. Christ came to put away. And you can have this removed so you can receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ and be right before God. This word sets us free from sin. This word sets us free from Satan. We spent so much time in different passages of Scripture laying out the reality, but let me uh, hit just again another passage briefly that is familiar for many of us in Ephesians chapter 4, where we're told here in Ephesians chapter 4 that Paul says, beginning in verse 17 of Ephesians 4, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you from henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Don't walk like pagans do. What does that look like, Paul? Well, they walk in the vanity of their minds, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. According to God's word, that's the condition of those that are outside of Jesus Christ. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and he says, You who were dead, in verse 1, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our lifestyle, conversation in time past, in the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, that is destined for God's wrath, even as others. That's what we are, apart from the grace of God extended to us through Jesus Christ. That's why I tell people when I've heard people say, well, I'd never be good enough to go to your church. I say, listen, if you knew the backstory on most of the people in our church, you wouldn't be worried about it. Because Paul here in Ephesians chapter 2 is describing those who were dead in their trespasses and sins, and he's talking about himself, and he's talking about you, and he's talking about me. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy 
for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. You were walking around in the realm of evil and sin and opposition to God, but he has saved you and placed you into Christ, so you can now walk around in the realm of that which is pleasing to him. Why? Because he's gracious, that's why. Why am I saved and someone else isn't? Because God's grace. I, I don't know. But I know that when I heard his words, I believed. See, walking in his light, we will see. We see our true nature, our condition, our true nature. But Jesus is our one true hope. He speaks the word of God. And it is this word that sets us free from sin. It is this word that sets us free from Satan. It is this word, ultimately, that sets us free from death. Verse 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Let's pick up that reading in verse 48. After he has said, he that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Again, time out, excuse me again, time out. If I look at any other human being and tell you on my own authority, you are not accepted by God, I have no authority to say that. I have no authority to say that. Okay? I love what Spurgeon said. I am thankful that I do not keep the keys of heaven. I am even more thankful that you do not. So for me to stand and say, hey, you're not right with God. Who am I to say that? Nobody. But I want you to see here again, Jesus himself said to those who say they believe him. Verse 47, he that is of God hears God's words. You, therefore, hear them not because you are not of God. God. Do you mean to tell me that Jesus would actually look at someone and say, you are not right with God? He just did. He just did. Do you mean to say that Jesus would actually criticize someone who is sincerely worshiping? He does that all over the place. Go back to John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Remember the woman from Samaria? And they have different practices and different understanding of God's word and different religion and she's asking hey you Jews think you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem and we think we're supposed to worship on this on Mount Gerizim over here which is right and Jesus says listen you don't even know what you're worshiping verse 47 you're not of God verse 48 then answered the Jews and said to him do we not say well that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? You've got a devil. Okay, we're not making much headway with the theological arguments. Let's just go to the name-calling, okay? Jesus answered, I have not a devil. I'm not demon-possessed. But I honor my Father. I glorify my Father. And you dishonor me. I seek not my own glory... There is one that seeks my glory, and he is the true judge. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
And once again, his hearers are just going to keep it right there in the physical realm and the temporal realm. Then said the Jews to him, verse 52, Now we know you have a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets. And you say, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Is that stronger than just who do you think you are? Who are you making yourself to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor's nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him. But I know him. If I should say I know him not, I'd be a liar like you. But Jesus is just not being very Jesus-y, is he? If I should say I don't know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, amen, amen, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, before he was born, I am. Then they picked up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus, the light, is our one true hope. He speaks the word of God. This word sets us free from Satan and from sin, and this word sets us free from death. If you abide in my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. One writer said, this freedom comes from Jesus personally. Verse 36, if the Son sets you free. And he notes this, it is a gift, not a pedigree. Verses 33 to 37. This freedom can't be had from our religious background, a succession of race or family, or from anything inherent in ourselves. It is given personally by Jesus himself. You know, it was just a few months ago that we were privileged to see my oldest son follow in baptism. And think about that. The pastor's son, 18 years old, before he's baptized. Why? Because you don't get extra points with God from being a pastor's kid. What we witness today, you've got to be able to say yourself, I believe. Right now at this moment, I am trusting Christ alone to be my sin bearer. I'm trusting his righteousness alone to make me right with God. And that's why I want to declare this. So the last thing I want to do is push my kids and say, listen, people are watching your dad. You better get baptized. If they're not in Christ, they shouldn't go anywhere near that thing. They need to be in Christ. And so do you. This freedom Christ offers, it's not a pedigree. Writer continues, it is eternal, not temporary. Verse 35, Jesus who gives this freedom is the eternal son who lives forever. So his gift sets us in union with him within the eternal life of God. And then notice again in verse 35, the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. It's expressed in obedience, not in independence. The recipient becomes a loving, obedient child within God's family. And see, that's where we as Americans think about freedom and it messes with our heads a little bit. Our society today talks about freedom and it messes with our heads because our society today thinks of freedom as I get to do whatever I want. It was Martin Luther who said that the human person is made Created, that is, to serve. He depicted the human will 
as a horse whose choices are limited to who will be its rider, whether God or the devil. Or we could say, in our context, God or me. The notion, he writes, of the radically independent individual who can do as he or she may please without reference to any other authority is, in fact, a straw man. This, quote, free person is a myth who never existed, and who never will. We are radically, incurably, and eternally dependent beings who were made to serve. Our freedom is not the freedom to do as we want, but the freedom from being controlled by our fallen hearts to do as God Wants. He writes, true freedom is not the liberty to do anything we please, but the liberty to do what we ought. And it is genuine liberty because doing what we ought now pleases us. Don't have time to go there, but Paul talks about in Romans, why did God set you free? Go to Romans chapter 6, God set you free from sin. Why? So you can just run off and do your own thing? No, so now you can serve him. That's the point. The worst, ex- the, the, the worst advice we give to people today is follow your heart. Be your true self, my true self, apart from God, is doomed to face his judgment. I don't want my true self. I want to be able to say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. It's Christ now that lives in me. This life that I'm now living in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't want to be found by God in my own righteousness, Paul said in Philippians 3. I want to be found in the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ. You don't need more of you. We need Jesus in control. He speaks the word of God. This word sets us free. He speaks the word of God. He speaks not only the word of God, but he seeks the glory of God. All the way through this passage here, we see him speaking of the way that he glorifies the Father. He is submissive to the Father. He says here, I didn't come of my own. I came in submission to my Father. I do what pleases Him. I'm telling you what I'm telling you is not something I made up myself. It's what I've been told from the Father. Everything I do is done in submission to the Father. As one said, Jesus knows God and invariably keeps His word. And again, in John, in his gospel, knowledge of God cannot be separated from obedience. That's Jesus' whole thing here. You say you're descendants of Abraham. You're not doing what Abraham would do. You say you're children of God, that God is your father. You're not honoring God. You're not doing what God says. There's obedience involved. He glorifies the father. He is sinless before the father. Verse 46, he says here, which of you convinces me of sin? And there's an interesting point that someone made. When Jesus makes a statement, who here is able to convict me of sin? That is such a powerful declaration of the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Because I guarantee I can't stand up in front of any group of people and say, all right, who here is actually able to convince me and convict me of sin? Well, that'd be anybody that spent more than 10 minutes with me can point something out most likely. But Jesus is not saying on the one hand, I've been so sneaky that you've never seen me sin so you can't prove anything. That's not what he's saying. And he also knows full well that he can't say, listen, none of you can, label, can, can level any accusation against me because that's all they've been doing and they'll continue to do that right up to his travesty of a trial before his crucifixion. They're going to be blaming him for stuff he didn't do. But Jesus is able to say to them, who among you is able to convict me of sin? And he knows before the truth of the Father who knows everything that there is nothing there that can convict him. 
we use the expression, God is my witness. The son is able to give testimony of himself before the all-knowing eyes of the father. There is none of you who is able to convict me of sin. He speaks the word of God. See, this is why he and he alone is our true hope because he tells us what God says. He's spoken the word and it is the word of Christ that is able to set us free, that's able to set us free and make us his. He's our one true hope because he seeks the glory of God. He glorifies the Father and the Father glorifies him. He is our one hope because he's able to do what you and I can't do. Take you back there in verse 28. We reminded ourselves that Jesus bridged the chasm that we can't cross and he bridged that chasm by his cross. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. And no one else can say that. He alone can say that. He alone is able to give us what we need in right standing to the Father. Jesus, the light, is our one true hope. He speaks the word of God. He seeks the glory of God and powerfully, he is God. See, whatever ideas you and I might bring to the text, it's important that we understand that Jesus was speaking to a real audience of real people who had a real understanding of what Jesus was saying. Jesus speaks to them about Abraham. And he says to them, you've not known him, the father, but I know him. He said in verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now is he referring specifically to the promise that Abraham received from God that said, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed in Genesis 12 and in, in Genesis 12, and, and so when his son Isaac is born, he's seeing, hey, God is going to fulfill that promise. Is, is that the day that Jesus is speaking of, perhaps? Is it the day in which God comes to him and tells him to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain that he'll show him, and, and Abraham says to his son Isaac, God will provide, God himself will see to it. He will provide himself the lamb, and, and as they take him up there, he is stopped by God from sacrificing Isaac and finds that ram there, and God reiterates that promise to him. Is that the day that he's speaking of? Perhaps. Some of the Jewish scholars of Jesus' day believed that Abraham may have actually received some direct revelation from God that wasn't recorded in Scripture about that day when Messiah is going to come and set things right. But whatever Jesus is referring to in Abraham's life here, one writer said it is unlikely that Jesus' opponents got angry with him because they heard him ascribing powers of foresight to Abraham. They've got no problem with what he says about Abraham. The point of tension arose because of the way Jesus phrases this. He doesn't say, for example, your father Abraham rejoiced to see the messianic age. No, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. The day. The day of the Lord. The nation of Israel is looking for that day. They read Isaiah and they're looking for that day. When God will glorify himself, when, like the prophet said, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And Jesus says, Abraham saw, past tense, my day. He rejoiced to see my day. Jesus identifies the ultimate fulfillment of all Abraham's hopes and joys with his own person and work. Do you understand that? See, we, we, are, we are post-resurrection. We've got the whole New Testament, and we'll read that and think, well, yeah. Do you understand what Jesus was saying right there? And for those that say, well, Jesus never actually claimed to be God, what else is he doing? Abraham rejoiced to see my 
day. Okay, now you're just being ridiculous. You're not even 50 years old. And no, the point is not to start doing the calculations. Well, if we say, okay, so how old was he? He was perhaps, that's not the point. He's not old enough to have seen Abraham at all or interacted with Abraham at all. You're not even yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was. If you go back in chapter 8, we just read verse 28 a couple of times. When we have lifted up the Son of Man, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you, you will know that I am. Is he making reference to that I am statement there? Perhaps. But here, no question. Before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, I am. And we are right back to the burning bush from where God spoke to Moses before they brought the people out of Egypt. Moses said, okay, Egypt's got lots of gods. Who am I supposed to tell them is sending me? I am that I am. You go tell them I am has sent you. Jesus says before Abraham was, I am. Was that how Jesus hearers understood it? Is that did Jesus hearers understand that to be a claim to deity? Yeah. How do you know? Because immediately they begin to pick up rocks to stone him to death for blasphemy. That was the correct penalty, by the way. Death by stoning. But that was supposed to be conducted in an orderly and intentional trial, not by an angry mob. And Jesus has already said he will lay down his life. He will be lifted up, but that's not, not this way and not now. So how much supernatural power and what was the technique by which Jesus passed by and, and moved away, we're not told. John just says, hey, again, if it's not time, it's not time. And it wasn't time. So Jesus left the temple grounds. Augustine of old made the statement, as man, that is Jesus, as man flees from the stones here, but woe to those from whose heart of stone God flees. The man Jesus fled from their physical stones, yes, but there were hearts of stone here from which Jesus, as God, has departed and walked away. You know, think about the account of, in the Gospels of Jesus going to the Gadarenes there and casting out the, the, the legion from that man who was possessed. And the people from the town come rushing out and see that man who'd been possessed, clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And their response was, would you get out of here? And what did he do? He got in the boat and left. Jesus has come to the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles and said, Are you thirsty? Come to me and drink. I'm the light of the world. Come to me. You won't walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. He says to those that believed in him, abide in my words and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. He said, if you'll keep my words, you will not taste death. He declares to them, I am. And their response is to pick up stones to throw at him. As a quick aside to those of us who are in Christ, is it any wonder that when we actually follow Jesus, we get responses that are less than friendly? Verse 
But as one writer stated, he is the eternal Christ, sharing the everlasting life of the Father, the changeless Lord who towers over history, master of time, ruler of the ages, undiminished by the passing of the centuries, the same yesterday and today and forever. To a generation like ours, conscious of the brevity of life, in a culture where time is replacing money as the commodity of highest value, We feel constantly threatened by time's flow. It runs through our fingers. It escapes us no matter how frantically we try to fill it and hold it back. But Christ has all time in his hands. And as we rest our lives in him, our fragile, ephemeral consciousness finds meaning and permanence. He is still able to save to the uttermost Those who come to God by him. There's only one right response to this Christ. There's only one right response to him. Believe him. And bow to him. And as we've reiterated from this passage the last two weeks... Only those who follow truly believe. I'm not asking you for a mental agreement. I'm calling you to repent. To turn from yourself and turn to him. To bow to him as Lord, he controls all of it. As it's been said, most people don't shy away from the Bible or steer clear of the Bible because they think it really contradicts itself. They steer clear of the Bible because it contradicts them. I read things in here that don't do what I want them to do. The response is to bow to him. For some of us today, most of us today, perhaps all of us today, I don't see your heart. Perhaps for all of us today, we are in Christ and our response today is to be reminded of this truth and again in our hearts return to God as our Heavenly Father and acknowledge you're still in charge and I want to please you and forgive me for where I don't and I'm seeking to. And our hearts should reach out in compassion to our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers that we know do not know Christ yet and we want to share this truth. He is the light for the world and he is our one true hope and we want to take that hope to them. But maybe there's even one here today who for the very first time what you need to do is acknowledge, yeah, I've been religious Yeah, I've mentally accepted that there is a real person named Jesus. And yeah, I can say yes to all the things in the doctrinal statement, whatever you'd want to show me. I I think the Bible is true. Yeah, all that's true. And I, I try to be a good person. Yeah, all that's true. Maybe today what you need to realize and understand is that you've been doing what these people have been doing. Keep Jesus in my category up here. Mentally agree. Yep, he's true. I've got it. But I'm still in charge. Maybe today for the first time you need to repent of your rebellion against your creator. You need to repent of going your own way. You need to repent of telling your creator God you will tell him where he fits. And you will throw the full weight of your trust for your eternal soul on the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. And you will for the first time bow to him and say everything I have and everything I am is yours forgive my rebellion against you make me yours please save me and make me yours and be my Lord maybe that's what you need to do for the first time today but let's hear the word and hearing let us respond let's abide in Jesus word hear his truth and let his truth set us free